Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm James Shore. Every week we come up with an interesting software engineering skill or technique, uh, come up with a challenge related to that skill and solve it live on stream. And this week it's mocks and spies. If you'd like to follow along with the code today, you can download it from GitHub. It is up here, github.com slash James Shore slash livestream. Check out this tag, uh, 2020-05-19. Uh, if questions and comments are welcome, please uh, join in in the chat. I see we've already got some uh, <laughs> some comments going on here. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Woldy, great to see you. Pellet, good to see you again. Okay, so let's get right into this. Mocks and spies, what are they? Well, you've, you've probably heard of them, but just in case you haven't, mocks and spies are a way of testing the interactions of your code with other parts of your system. And they're also a way of isolating. And I think that a lot of people who are using mocks are concerned more about the isolation aspect of the mocks and spies or test doubles as they're called generically. But actually, to my understanding, the reason mocks were originally created was though that a particular design style could be used. This design style was, uh, was written in a book called Growing Object-Oriented Software guided by tests by Nat Price, or Steve Freeman and Nat Price, who are also the people who originally invented mocks. I have not read that book, although I've been meaning to for some time. I hear it's excellent. My best understanding of what they're describing in that book is that they're describing a design technique where you're very focused on the interactions between objects. And mocks are a way of testing that your code interacts appropriately. It also has the ability to isolate your code from, from its dependencies, which is nice. When you use a mock or a spy, you, you pass it in to the thing, the subject, the unit under test. And instead of running its real dependency, in this case, it's A is the thing being tested and B is its dependency. Instead of A running B, it runs the thing that you passed in. Now, passing in an object to run is called dependency injection, which of course is the most complicated term ever for passing in a variable. But that's another rant. That's mocks and spies. I think most people have heard of them or have used them, so that's actually not the focus of today's session. We will be using mocks and spies in today's session, but today's session is really about the common problems that I see with mocks. Uh, often, as, as I see mocks commonly used in the wild, uh, you tend to see tests that are really complicated and hard to understand. Uh, that's partly because of out-of-order execution. Uh, mocks famously are arrange assert act instead of the more natural arrange act assert. The setup tends to be really complicated and your code is about the methods that you're calling and the interactions with your third parties, not the outcomes that you see from your code. Uh, this can make code harder to refactor because those assertions and those declarations are spread all throughout all your tests. And uh, mocks don't always reflect real world behavior. So you have to have additional tests uh, in order to make sure that your code really works. So these are some common problems with mocks, and that is what we're going to be looking at today. Our challenge is going to be continuing our Rote 13 application that we've used in previous weeks. And if you want to see any of those previous episodes, you can find them at jameshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn URLs on the bottom of the screen there. Uh, in previous uh, previous weeks, we've created a Rote 13 transform program. Rote 13, of course, is the little uh, spoiler hiding thing you see on the internet. We've created a command line wrapper so that we can interact with the command line. And we actually even wrote a little bit of code to run this, but we didn't test drive it. So this week, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be test driving our application code, the code that orchestrates command line and wrote 13, and make sure it interacts with those objects correctly. And uh, we're gonna do that, of course, with mocks. So the question is, not how do we do that, but how do we do it cleanly? How do we keep our mock-based tests clean and easy to understand? I'm going to let you cogitate on that for a moment. Uh, what makes this stream possible is the people who hire me for training and consulting. There is a group of very fine, above average people who uh, would like to improve their software development capacity or capability in some way. They bring me to work with, they bring me in to work with them on everything from test driven development training all the way up to helping them organize their, their software team so that they can scale better. Really common problem is that 
as t companies grow, they tend to start seeing bottlenecks and communication problems between their teams. And uh, that's not just a social problem, that's also a technology problem, and I help with both sides of that. I tend to work with companies that are low bureaucracy, that have a lot of capability for business agility, but don't necessarily have the uh, organizational structure set up yet to take advantage of that. So these folks uh, come to me and ask me to help, and thanks to them that I can do this today for you. So if you'd like to join this group of above average folks, uh, send me an email at jshore at jamesshore.com. Uh, I'd be happy to set up a free consultation to talk about how I can help you and your teams. All right, let's get back to our challenge. We're going to be test driving the application code for our Rote 13 application using mocks. How are we going to do that? Well, as I said, there's several problems, and I have a, a confession to make. One of these problems, the fact that integration tests are required, is, well, it can't be solved if you're using mocks. It's sort of just built into the, the fact of using mocks. If you're using mocks, you do also need integration tests. But these other problems, they are solvable. And they're solvable with actually some fairly basic techniques. It's just that people don't use them. So first off, if you have out of order execution, if you have the arrange assert act problem, you can use spies instead of mocks. Spies allow you to make assertions about how your code was interacted after it was run instead of before it was run. If you have a lot of complicated setup, uh, there's a couple of things you can do here. One is, and not everybody agrees with me on this, but one is that you can not use mocks to test your simple logic dependencies. Now, Justin Searles, uh, who speaks a lot about mocks and has some great things to say, and I have a link to one of his talks in the README, as well as a link to the Growing Object Oriented Software book that I mentioned earlier. He thinks, he says that you should mock everything. If you're, if you're testing your interactions, you should only test interactions. And I think he makes a good point, but I also find that testing every interaction does make your test code more complicated, and that, that extra complexity isn't always worth it. So for simple logic dependencies, you can just use them for real. Now what this results in is this results in your test now having to be coded so that it understands how that underlying dependency works. And if you don't want to do that, you can use the dependency in your test as well. And I'll show you that when we get to the example. Additionally, if you have complicated setup, you can do what you can you can do the same thing you do with any code, which is you can hide it behind a clean interface that makes it easier to understand. And I'm going to demonstrate that. And finally, the assertions, if they're hard to understand because they've got all this sort of mocky stuff sort of baked into it, you can make that easier to understand by wrapping that too. And putting all these things together does make a big difference. So let's see what that looks like in practice. Now, again, if you'd like to follow along, go to github.com slash jameshore slash livestream, clone that repo, and check out the tag 2020-05-19. At the end of the stream, I'll, I'll upload the finished results, and I'll use the tag 2020-05-19-n, so you can see the results if, uh, if you want to look at them later. If you're following along, the way you can build the code is by using build. Uh, dot slash build dot sh or on Windows you can use just build that will run the code you'll need to have node.js installed because this is written in node.js but everything else is vendored into the repo you shouldn't have to do anything else except install build node.js and run that build if you run a, if you want to run a quick build that only test the things that have changed, use the quick option. And if you want to have the build automatically run when the files change, use the watch command or watch dot slash watch h dot slash watch a dot sh on uh, Mac and Unix, watch on Windows. And when that runs, you're going to get a nice sound like that, according to whether your tests have passed or failed. And you can also run the application by typing run uh, hello or run whatever you want, and it will pass it through. Okay, let's uh, let's get into this. Our code, we already have some run code. It's right here, run.js, and this is what we're going to be re-implementing. Re it's very straightforward. Our code just interacts with the command line, uh, gets the arguments from the command line wrapper that we built last week, transforms it using the wrote 13 algorithm we wrote the re week before that, and then writes it back out to the command line uh, using our command line wrapper. Again, this isn't really the challenge. The challenge is how do we test this using mocks and doing that in a clean way? So let's start out by 
writing this in sort of the classic way that people often use mocks, we can critique that and then see how to make it simpler and better. So I'm going to start out by making a test. So we've got our app test. And we'll describe our application. And say that it's going to read a command line argument, transform it with route 13, and write result. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to build this up step by step. I'm going to use sign-on, which is a really popular mocking framework for, for JavaScript. And then later on, when we get to using spies, we'll, I'll introduce another tool. So we'll start out with sign-on, which I'll need to put up here. And the way sign-on works is after every test, you need to reset sign-on so that it gets back to sort of a neutral state. With sign on, we can we can mock our command line, which I'm going to need to bring in here, and our route 13, which I'm going to bring in here. And it would help if I spelled infrastructure right. Okay, the way we mock this in sign on is we just say sign on dot mock and then we pass in an object that we want to mock. So I have to actually create the real thing and then we mock it like this. And the same is true for our route 13. And once we've done this, we can inject them into our application. like this. Now this isn't going to work, we don't have an app. So let's go ahead and define that. That's failing because we still don't have an app. Now it's failing because we don't have create. Still don't have create. And there we go. Let's go ahead and take our injected command line and wrote 13. Remember, dependency injection is just a really fancy way of saying pass in the variable, unless you're using a framework, which I tend not to do. Um, Charlie Pancakes asks, uh, any reason you're not using ES6 syntax? I'm just waiting for uh, Node.js to make it more of a first class citizen. Uh, which maybe they've done by now. I haven't really been keeping up with it. Uh, so we're going to take this uh, create uh, this command line and wrote 13 injected uh, dependencies, and we're going to construct our application using those. In JavaScript, I tend to use a static create factory method, mostly because just JavaScript stuff. Uh, in other languages, I wouldn't bother. I just use the constructor. Okay, so now we've injected our dependencies, that is, we've made them available for this class to use. So now we can get on to, uh, to actually testing this. We're going to test that our application interacts with its dependencies in a specific way. Uh, namely, we want the application to read the command line arguments from the command line object and, write, and then transform them and then write them back out. So we can assert that it's going to read them from the command line by saying, command line mock expects the args method to be called. And when it does, I'm going to say that it returns my input. Now that's not going to, uh, let's see, 
I was going to say that's not going to fail, but it did because I've called the wrong thing. So that's not going to fail because we're just setting up our expectation. We're not doing anything yet. Next thing we need to do is run our app. And that's going to fail, but only because we don't have a run method yet. So I'll go ahead and add that. And now our test should pass again. And now to actually make this check that the assertion was met, I need to say command line mock dot verify. Now it's going to say that we expected the arguments to be called once, but it was never called. So we can fix this by saying that we're going to call command line args. And now we've made our test pass. So that's the first step. We've, we're have we checking that we're interacting with the command line uh, correctly. Now we need to make sure that we're interacting with route 13 correctly. We're going to say that route 13 expects the transform method to be called with the exact arguments my input. So we want to say that the input that came from the command line needs to go into the route 13 uh, object. And when it does, it's going to return the output. And I'm just going to say my output. That's not what the way route 13 really behaves, but because we're isolating this code from the real behavior of the application, it doesn't matter. And you could argue that this makes what's going on a little more obvious. And we're going to need to say route 13 mock here instead of route 13. And once again, I need to remember the S. Okay, that's not failing because uh, we're not verifying it. So I'll add that here. Now we're saying expects to transform my input to be called, but it wasn't. So I'm going to say that our input is the first argument, and then I'm going to transform. The input and that should make our test pass and it does and then finally we need to assert that this is writing the information back out so I'm going to do that by saying that we expect the write output function to be called with the exact arguments my output And it's saying attempted to wrap undefined property. That's because I got this wrong. Then that's, that's the nice thing about using a mocking framework rather than rolling your own, is it will catch, catch, catch these sorts of errors. Okay, so now it's saying that my output wasn't called. So we can do that. And that should be our code. There we go. Now that we've got this all the way through, we actually don't need this route 13 mock verify. And the reason we don't need it is because if this code isn't working, then this code won't work. So we can take that out. Uh, let me show you. If we're not calling route13.transform, then, and we're just doing that, then our test will still fail. And we don't want to over specify in our test. We want to do the minimum, the minimum specification needed in our test to to talk about what's what's going on. So that is a mock-based test. Uh, in order to complete this, we need to modify our run code to actually call into application. So let's do that. We're going to say app.create with our command line and our route 13. This is the real one. And then we'll tell it to run. This code isn't tested, uh, except by linting. So to really properly test this, we would need an additional smoke test, but I'm not going to do that today. Uh, we uh, did do something similar on the Coding Challenge Friday. So if you want to see what that looks like, come on by on Friday. Again, that starts uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time, an hour earlier than this one. But I can check this manually. And there we go, still working. <laughs> All right. So that's our first test. Let's do a little bit more here. Let's Now that we've got the ability to test this code, let's make it a little bit more interesting. We know what happens if we take a command line argument, but what if there's no command line argument? Right now, it's going to crash. So 
Instead, let's say that it writes the usage to the command line when no argument provided. That is going to be largely the same. Let's put these together. Then I'll copy this and put that here. We're just going to say that we return no arguments and we're going to expect the output to be usage run text to transform. And that's going to fail because, well, for several reasons. We're not calling transform, but also our expectation here is wrong. We want to say that transform should never be called. So let's go ahead and solve that. We can do that by saying, extracting this variable, and then checking the length with the guard clause. and saying that the usage is run text to transform. And I expected that to work. Uh, it looks like it's complaining about, uh, it's, it was called, but it wasn't called with exactly the right text. So let's do that. And this is something that you tend to see with mocks is that the error codes, the error messages tend to be not totally clear. Sign-ons aren't bad, but uh, I find that the errors from mock-based tests are harder to read. Okay, so that's uh, testing when there's no command line arguments. Uh, Woolley says we could refactor the test by moving the mock instantiations up to a before each. Absolutely we can, and uh, I'm going to get to that after we've done a little bit more here. So what if we have too many command line arguments? Let's go ahead and talk about that. So let's say that it complains when too many command line arguments provided. So here I'll say A and B, and we'll just say too many arguments is what we're expecting out of that. So again, transform is being called. So we'll put in another guard clause, return, and we'll need to put the correct output out on the command line. And there we go. So this is sort of a basic version of mocks. This is the kind of code I tend to see in the real world. Uh, obviously a lot of duplication here. Uh, Woldy mentioned one of this. And also it's kind of hard to understand. Uh, we've got all this sort of mock stuff going on. Uh, I find that when I come back to a mock-based test after I've been away from it for a while, or if I'm looking at something that somebody else wrote, I really have to sort of puzzle it through. What is going on here? Uh, so that's what I want to start to fix. Let me go ahead and check in what we've got so far. So we've created app and app.run uh, with uh, basic mocking. A uh, comment from TPM2209 uh, says, uh, this is great because I've never seen anyone write a working object mock in Jest, but it looks like writing the mock in the test first ensure you write the object in a mockable way. Yeah, and I think that is part of the idea is that by doing this test driven, by doing any code test driven, you are ensuring that the thing that you're writing is actually testable. And part of the idea of this London School of Testing, uh, London School is sort of mock-oriented and, and focused on interactions. Although, again, I'm not sure if I'm representing this correctly. But my understanding is part of the purpose here is that by having our interactions defined in our test, it's forcing us to think about the design of our code better and how we want those interactions to work. Um, and that has a lot of value. Uh, TPM adds, uh, the shops I've worked in so far have treated a test 
treated testing as an afterthought, which is probably why their objects are so, so difficult to just hook in. That is so true. That is so true. Uh, so many places treat testing as an afterthought and then say, well, we can't test because it's too hard. Well, it may be because you're treating it as an afterthought. Uh, Woldy says, uh, can we make it read like well-written prose? That is, I think, in my mind, the def the, what a great test involves, uh, is it should read like a story. It should tell the story of the code under test. So let's start working on that. The first thing that we're going to do is I want to fix this problem of the test not speaking naturally. It says, it says arrange, assert, and then act. Arrange, assert, act. And I would prefer it said arrange, act, assert, which is sort of once upon a time this happened and this resulted. That's more of telling a nice story. So let's look at that first. Now, we could do that with sign on, but sign on doesn't have great support for spies. So I'm going to bring in a different testing tool called test double. And we're going to transform these tests from using mocks to using spies. Now, mocks and spies are very similar. The only difference is really where the assertions happen. But let's take this through. So we're going to do this one at a time. Code's going to be very similar. Uh, we're going to create a command line. Uh, in test double, you don't have separate mock objects from the re thing being mocked. Uh, it's just sort of all munched together, which is quite nice, actually. So we'll say create a double of our command line. And hopefully I did that mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And we'll create a double of our root 13. Uh, Pellet asks, uh, aren't spies real objects that allow you to interrogate afterwards to see if things were called? It can, yes and no. Uh, spies do allow you to interrogate afterwards to see if they're called. Absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, but not all spies are real objects. Uh, you can also have spies that are stubs. And this gets into the whole taxonomy of what is a test double, and I think people spend way too much time on it. Uh, but uh, ultimately, what I'm creating here is a spy that is also a stub. But I'll typically call them just mocks or test doubles, regardless of what they really are. Okay, so we've created our command line our route 13. We'll pass those through to our application, injecting them into our app. And now we need to set up the same sort of assertions and expectations that we did for our with for the sign-on version. So I'm going to say test double when command line is called is called with args, then we'll return the same thing, an array of my input. And when wrote 13 transform is called with the arguments my input, then we'll return my output. Then I can run our application and I can verify that command line dot write output was called with the option my output. And that is the spy version of the mocks. Uh, you can see we can prove that this is actually working by commenting this out. We get an error, unsatisfied verification on test double write output. We wanted it to be called with my output, but there were no invocations. I really like the error messaging on test double as a tool. I think they, I think uh, Justin Strolls put a lot of effort into this, or it looks like he did, and uh, it's very nice. So let's go ahead and enable this. And we can do the same thing in our other tests. Let's go ahead and go on through. Here we're going to return nothing. We're not going to assert that never was, or that, uh, that transform was never called. That's kind of redundant. And uh, the, the test double philosophy is you only really set up the, the expectations and the assertions that you really need. And so we'll come down here. We'll get rid of this verify. And we'll say command line, verify command line, write output. 
like that. And let's prove that this is working by taking this out. There we go, that's working. And let's go ahead and convert our final test. But before I do that, just a uh, final chance to look at the compare at these two, Mox versus Spies, very similar. We've got the same sort of setup. We've got the same sort of preparation about how things should be used. The real difference is that the expectation in a mock comes before and with a spy, it comes after. The assertion comes after, and I, I like that it comes after. So let's go ahead and bring this through. I'll have this return A and B. Runner application, let me grab this, and we'll put that in there. There, I, I hope that was a little messy. I hope I did it right. Let's see, that's gonna be command. Oh, I thought I brought these through, but apparently I didn't. There we go, and let's just confirm that this is working. It is, great. So that's us using spies versus mocks. Now we're doing arrange, act, assert, rather than arrange, assert, act. Uh, Woldy says, uh, I find it interesting that you don't su suffix your spies with mock like I did for sign on. And that's because in, um, in sign on, there is actually a distinction between the mock object and the handle for dealing with the mock. And so I called the handle for dealing with the mock command line mock and the mock object is command line mock dot object. But in test double, they're both in the same place. So I don't need to distinguish the two of them. Uh, Woldy adds, I find that removing the noise from the variable names helps with read readability, and I agree, and that's why I didn't do it in this case. Okay, so that's, that's spies versus mocks. Uh, let me go ahead and check this in. And actually, I can get rid of the sign on dot reset here, and I can get rid of that. And let me amend that commit since I haven't pushed it up to y'all. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a little bit easier to read, but these are still kind of a mess. And I think now we can get to the thing that Woldy mentioned earlier, which is that we've got this repeated setup everywhere and we really don't need it. Actually, before I get to that, uh, there's one other thing I want to do. And I talked about in the introduction, I talked about how we can not mock out everything. Now again, some people would disagree with this, but I find that for simple logic dependencies, there's it's, it's easier and cleaner to not mock those logic dependencies than to mock them. And in our case, root 13 is one of those simple logic dependencies. If we just pass in the real thing, the code works just as well. I can just use the real thing instead of making it rather than having any setup in my tests. Now that is going to fail because the real thing doesn't return my output. It returns ZL Voxes. <laughs> and I can type that in here. Now that really bugs some people. Uh, now I'm coupling my app test to the behavior of root 13, which is not the thing under test. And that is a valid complaint. Personally, I find that having higher level tests do a double check that says, this is the way I expect the dependency to work. I Sometimes I find that valuable, but sometimes I don't. And when I don't, what you can do is you can just call the dependency in your test as well. You can say expected output equals rot13.transform my input, like that. Now you get the best of both worlds. You get code that's not going to fail when, uh, when the dependency changes, and you have the simplicity of using the real dependency rather than having to mock it out.
Now, again, Justin mm -hmm. Strolls doesn't think this is a good idea. I think other people don't think it's a good idea. Like anything in software engineering, it's a trade-off between where do you want your complexity? Do I want my complexity? Uh, do I want the, the slight ugliness of doing this, or do I want the slight ugliness of setting up the dependency and, and a mock for it? Eh, that's, that's your call. But if we do do that, we can simplify our app by not having to inject Route 13 to it. We can just use the real thing, like this. And in fact, we can make this even simpler like this. And by doing that, we can take it out here. We can take it out here. We can take it out here, here. here, and that was redundant actually, here and here. So is that trade-off worth it? That's your call. But that is one way to simplify our test by using the real dependency. So let me go ahead and check that in. Okay, now let's go back to these this duplicated setup. This isn't duplicated. In fact, I'm going to inline it. But these two lines of code here are duplicated everywhere. And we could factor that out to a before each block, and a lot of people do that. But I find that using a before each block is too limiting. Uh, it doesn't allow you to parameterize it, and it assumes that you're going to have the same setup for every test. So instead of using before each block, what I do is I factor this code out into a setup function. If you're using another language that doesn't allow you to have multiple returns like JavaScript does, you can use a private class, and there's some interesting things you can do with that. We might explore those this Friday. Again, we've got Coding Challenge Friday at 11 o'clock on Friday, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's an hour earlier before this, before this stream started. So we've got our setup. Now we can factor that into our other methods as well, our other tests as well. And now that we've done this, something we have the opportunity to do something interesting. We have another piece of duplicated setup all over the place, which is the way we set up our command line arguments. We can actually pass those into our setup. Let's do it this way. Let's make that uh, variable. We'll take this and we'll move it down into here and pass it through like this. And we'll do the same thing here and here. And I can inline this. Now we've taken that sort of messy defining how the args are, are put in. We've taken that and we've hid it in a way and behind a nice clean setup function, which I think for this particular set of tests is nice. It's not gonna work in every case and the, which, the way you factor out your setup is going to vary, is going to vary but um, there's always a way to clean it up. Sometimes if you've got a bunch of different things that you want in your setup, I'll actually use uh, named and optional arguments like this so that the ones you're not using get defaults that work. Uh, there's lots of things you can do with this to make it to make it interesting. So that cleans things up pretty nicely. A uh, couple of chat comments in the chat. Woldy uh, uh, likes that it's clean. Uh, Brian Olor, uh, refactoring tests is so important. This is great. I so agree. It's really important that you refactor your tests, and I think it's even more important that you refactor them when you're using mocks, because by default, mocks tend to be pretty complicated, uh, pretty hard to understand. So let me check this in. We factored out common mock setup. 
This is pretty clean now. The only gripe I have with this code is that this is still kind of hard to understand. Again, whenever I'm looking at mock-oriented code, I end up having to decipher it. But you can, just like with any other code, if it's hard to understand, you can abstract it. And here, what we're really doing, what we're really doing is we're saying we want to assert that the output is the expected output. So let's take this and factor it into a method that does that for us. like that. And we'll need to pass in the command line too, which I'll have to pass through here. There we go. So now here we can say assert output and here we can do the same thing. And now we have really nice, clean tests that tell a story. Uh, once upon a time, we set up our code to have the arguments my input. When we ran the code, we ran the code, and then we saw that we got the output of rot13 being transformed. This one might be easier to read like this. I'm not sure. Uh, same thing here. Once upon a time, we set up our code to be called with uh, no command line arguments. We ran it, and then we saw usage run to text to transform. Not the, ne not the great American novel, but I think it does make the code nice and easy to read. Uh, Woldy says, I want to call out the pattern in your setup. Uh, it's in your setup, though. It's nice to have a little section for defining the mocks followed by a single segment for creating a uh, system under test. Um, I think Woldy, I'm not sure, but I think Woldy likes the fact that these two are, are together. And that is how you can test your code using mocks. You can test drive code using mocks and keep the code nice and clean. In a few moments, uh, I'm going to have opportunity for more questions and comments. Uh, before that, though, uh, some announcements for you all. Uh, First off, our next Lunch and Learn stream is going to be next Tuesday. It's at the same time as this one, Tuesday at noon Pacific. And what we're going to be doing next time, I think, is going to be a really interesting session. We're going to be doing the same stuff, except we're going to be looking at how to do this sort of testing without mocks. Uh, solving the problems that we've solved already, but also solving the problem of how do we make sure that the code actually works without needing additional tests around it. So that's going to be a great session. Don't miss it. Next Tuesday at noon Pacific. Uh, before that, this Friday, Coding Challenge Friday, starts at 11 a.m. Pacific. That's an hour earlier. We're going to be doing more work with mocks, uh, like you've seen here. Uh, go into more detail using our sample cribbage application. So if you'd like to try a challenge with this or, uh, or just see a more in-depth example, come on by on Friday. That's a more casual stream, more opportunities for conversation. Uh, last time we had some great conversation about design and the role of private methods and so forth. Uh, so 11 a.m. Pacific on Friday, and then next Tuesday, Lunch and Learn, noon Pacific on Tuesday. So, uh, oh, and again, if you liked what you saw here today and you'd like to have uh, some TDD training for yourself about your languages at your pace using your frameworks and, and libraries, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. I'm happy to set up. A free consultation. So, uh, question from Pellet, uh, doesn't this approach get messy when you try to expand the functionality? And it, to a degree, uh, yes. Um, he says, uh, Pellet goes on to say, I'm having a hard time coming up with a proper example, but it seems like if this application requirement changed that based on some arbitrary check on input you need to some other transform, then these expectations get messy. Um, yeah, it can get a little messy, but I think that messiness is actually a signal that maybe your code's doing too much. If it's getting too messy, then it's time to start extracting out. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that I want to say about this code is that, remember that one of our, one of the problems that we said we had was that the code tends to be harder to refactor when you use mocks, and that's because you've got your assertion sort of spread all throughout your code. What, what this does for you is it, it puts all of your 
implementation specific assertions and setup behind common methods so that when you refactor, now there's only one place to refactor. So it's easier to refactor when you do things this way. And so Pellet, if you find that your code's getting too big and messy, just factor it out, extract it, uh, extract the pieces that are messy and make it simpler again. But I think we'll get into this a little bit more on, fr on Friday in the fr uh, Coding Challenge Friday. Uh, we'll make a bigger problem. It will probably get a little bit messier. And there are some techniques with optional parameters to make the setup uh, stay fairly clean. Uh, Uncle Scientist says uh, this went super fast. Yeah, there is there was a lot a lot of ground covered here. Um, I do like to try to make the the uh, Tuesday lunch and learn fast and focused. So, but the VOD will be up, and also again, uh, JamesShore.com/blog/lunchandlearn. I put edited versions of all of the streams on there. Uh, they go up on YouTube, and they'll be up there indefinitely. Whereas the Twitch ones tend to uh, disappear after a little while. Uh, Pellet is coming back to the question of things getting messy. Um, Woldy says, or yes, refactor and extract before you add to it if it's going to be messy. Pellet says, uh, perhaps I understood that incorrectly, but that to then tends to lead to a large number of classes. I think there's always a trade-off between, well, all engineering is trade-offs, right? So we have the choice. We can have our a, a big class under test, a big subject under test, and a complicated set of setup and abstraction methods. We could have simple setup and abstraction or no setup and abstraction, but then complicated tests. Or we can have multiple classes and, and each of them having simple setup and abstractions. And it's just a question of where do you want your poison? And there's no, I think, really clear right answer for this. It's just a matter of Judge, making your own judgment call. And again, this is where stuff like pair programming, collective code ownership, mob programming, anything that gets other people to bring their opinion in, will I think create a better consensus design, uh, one that works for more people on your team and more people are going to look at it later. Uh, when you work alone, when we work alone, when I work alone, it's really easy to create something that makes sense to us personally, but doesn't make sense to others. Um, Waldy says, uh, more classes is a, I, I assume there's, they're talking about more classes. That's one of the criticisms of TDD. The code is architected to be easy to test. Yeah. I, I <laughs> don't think Waldy really meant that as a criticism. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, just a few more moments. If there's any other questions, I would love to hear them. Uh, we've got a few more minutes before we're into the stream. Uh, just to recap what we've done here, we uh, have looked at test driving, uh, test driving the interactions of our command line application infrastructure by using a test double. Uh, first we use mocks, then we use spies. Uh, often the problem that you see with mocks is that the tests are hard to understand, the code is harder to refactor, and we fix that by, uh, by, doing, by using spies instead of mocks, by calling our simple logic dependencies for real, providing setup wrappers, and using custom, custom assertions. You can use your own approaches. There's This isn't, you must do it this way to do it right. The main lesson, if you take only lesson, only one lesson from today's session, if you take only one lesson, it's that all the tools you have in programming are available in all of your program, your tests, your production code, mocks, everything. If you can make things simpler and more readable with classes and abstractions and functions in your production code, you can do the same thing in your tests. And it's a really good idea to do that. And when you do, you make your tests much nicer and easier to read. That is it for this time. Again, Coding Challenge Friday, this Friday, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we're going to be doing a more detailed example of uh, testing with mocks. And then on Tuesday, we're going to look at how to do the same thing, testing without mocks, but also testing, doing these tests without integration tests. I think it's really good stuff. I'm looking forward to bringing it up. So don't miss that Tuesday at noon Pacific. That is it for me today. Thanks very much. I appreciate you all coming along. And I will see you all next time.